Ooh, the after lunch crowd, how lucky I am. Okay, guys, um, you've heard a lot about Padilla, so let's not talk about that anymore. Um, three years ago, the majority of my clients would come through an immigration pickup from, say, a probation officer that would call an immigration officer, uh, an application maybe that they filed that went wrong somewhere, or the apartment karma. You know, that's where you rent an apartment with somebody with an order of deportation lived there before, and the agents come to get that person and instead get you. Um, so that, that was the overwhelming majority of my clients. Plus, of course, the nice cases, the affirmative cases, people wanting to be citizens, petitioning, people wanting to bring in their spouses, um, people wanting to adopt children, you know, the happy practice. And in the past three years, uh, a couple of things have happened to change completely the landscape and has brought us who are immigration defense attorney and you together. And that is Georgia's participation in two programs, particularly the 287G and the Secure Communities. And I won't bore you on the details of these two programs, but basically what they mean is that if uh, a person who commits a crime, and of course in Georgia, everything that you can do with a car is a crime. Um, uh, if the person gets uh, detained, uh, the officers called immigration. And then immigration puts a hold on them. How many of you have heard the word ice hold? Do you have any idea what that means? Let me explain because I, I was basically asked to talk about the rabbit hole that is when your clients go through the ice hold. Uh, and you do not know what happens at the other end. And there is a life at the other end. Uh, sometimes um, irony is great. And the very best thing that could have happened to my client is that day when they drove with, let's see, too much laundry in their back seat, and they got that <laughs> ticket. And then they were ticketed also for driving without a license. And they get placed in deportation proceedings. And a year later, they have a green card in their hand. That's a happy ending. Most of these cases are not like that, but occasionally 287G in secure communities is a blessing to a family. Most of the time it's a curse. Um, and so what happens is that uh, when they, they become your clients and they get a state bond, um, the family says to you, well, should I pay it? Or maybe they'll ask that from the bond people, or maybe they'll ask that from the police officer. Our clients uh, do not have the tradition of skepticism towards authority that we do. And so they will try to seek legal advice from the people who are prosecuting them. It's a big problem for us, right? Um, and a lot of times they'll get the answer, no, why pay the state bond? You're not coming out anyways. Immigration has a hold. And basically what a hold means is that at the point that the state releases you, either because you've paid the bond or because you're done with whatever the state had against you and if you had to serve sentence, you did, then immigration has 48 hours to pick you up and detain you, and then immigration decides what, the, what to do with you. Um, the advice not to pay the state bond is generally bad advice, but not always. And the problem with immigration law is that there's always an exception. Uh, before paying a state bond, the individual's family should talk to an immigration attorney to see if it behooves the person to pay the bond. And I'll give you, the, the, I guess, the most common example. There is a relief from deportation called cancellation of removal. And that is for a person that's been in the United States 10 years and has U.S. citizen children if they can show X, Y, C. And at the end of that road, if they can show all of that, they could end up with a green card in their hand with permanent resident status. However, they have to accrue 10 years before immigration serves them with what it's called a notice to appear. That immigration paper saying, you're in deportation proceedings. So if your client has been here nine years, 11 months, and 29 days, and the family pays the bond, and immigration serves them with that notice to appear at the ninth year, 11 months and 29 days, that person is not eligible for applying for that relief because they've not been in the United States for 10 years prior to immigration issuing this paper to them. In that case, the family will be very upset with you if your advice was pay the bond, pay it now. Because if they had held off on paying the bond a week, three weeks, maybe six months, I've had a case where my client sat in state court for eight months 
and we were not gonna pay the bond, and we were not gonna, gonna plea, we were gonna drag it out, because at the end of that eight months, he would have 10 years in the United States. At the end of the eight months, he was, uh, he, we had a, they had a trial with a criminal trial, he was uh, uh, released of all of these charges, and then he passed on to immigration, and we were able to do cancellation. So it's not always good to pay that bond. Often it is, but it's not always. So it's very important that your clients or their family try to have a conversation with somebody who knows about immigration relief to say, can I pay this bond or not? So once the bond is paid, what happens? Immigration has 48 hours to pick them up. Do they pick them up in 48 hours? No, sometimes they don't. And so a lot of uh, attorneys call me and say, well, what should I do? Well, habeas corpus, that is the legal relief. But normally, the threatening of filing the habeas corpus, so just the filing of it, will normally get an immigration officer there quickly, and then your whole complaint will be moot, but at least your client will now be sitting in state. Um, on a few occasions in some of the, the counties where they don't have a lot of staff, I'll have to call and talk to the sheriff in charge and so forth and say, look, bud, it's been over 48 hours. What, you know, you gotta release him. I'm sorry, but immigration says they're gonna come pick him up and, and we gotta hold them. And I said, yeah, you gotta hold them for 48 hours and if they don't have them, then you gotta fold them. Uh, and they said, no, ma'am, immigration is gonna come pick him up and we have to go up and down and there's conversations usually with local council who go and say, sheriff, you gotta release him and, and they do. But most of the time what happens when you complain about the 48 hours is that before you get to do something really legal uh, about it, that ICE will pick them up. However, you shouldn't let your clients sit. Um, and so once the 48 hours are, are up, the 48 hours are up. And if you're not able to do some sort of a, a motion or habeas or, or make the phone call, you need to tell the family to go somewhere where somebody can pick up that phone and can make that call. So. Uh, Immigration, you've paid the state bond. Immigration has the 48 hour detainer. Immigration picks them up. Where do they go? Well, they go to immigration detention. And sometimes, like in Gwinnett County, that means moving from cell A to cell B <laughs> because they share. Uh, and it's very convenient for them. Uh, but oftentimes, it means one of the various detention centers that house immigration detainees in, in Atlanta. Uh, one of them is in Alabama, in, in Gadsden, uh, Etowah County, although I understand that those populations are dwindling. Um, another one is in South Georgia, in Lumpkin County. Uh, there is one in Irving County, which is close to Savannah. And then there's a temporary detention for people in the uh, city jail uh, detention there. Um, but that seems to be used less. But anyway, so they go to one of these centers. At some point, immigration considers whether they should bond them out or not, a civil immigration bond. And this is where it becomes really difficult. You really wanna tell your client, don't say, don't sign. But at the same time, you want them to sign a paper requiring, requesting to go see the immigration judge. And the reason for that is that if they do not sign that paper saying, I want to see an immigration judge, I'm going to hire a lawyer, I want to ex exercise my rights in immigration court, then the ICE agents are not going to offer them a bond. And then you're, you're going to have a bond denial from an ICE agent and you're going to have to go in front of an immigration judge. Sometimes an ICE agent will give your client a bond of $7,000, $10,000 and I've heard defense attorney saying, that's too much, go hire an immigration attorney to get it lowered. Well, in the world where I live, immigration land, when you walk into an immigration court to lower a bond that's say $10,000, you could walk out of there with a $20,000 bond. I think you often do. <laughs> Sometimes you say, oh no, 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 do not hire me, do not pay me, pay that bond, get out, and then come and see me. Because immigration judges have uh, the power to lower the bond, keep it the same, make it higher, or no bond that person. And by the way, in our lingo, no bond doesn't mean that you can leave without a bond. It means you're not coming out. And so um, an immigration attorney, uh, would, if the immigration ICE agent would not set a bond or would set a bond that is too high, 
uh, would then file for a motion for a bond hearing before the immigration court that has jurisdiction over the place where the person is detained. And that happens fairly quickly. And I'll talk to you about bonds and bond hearings in a moment. But I also want to tell you that they don't always get released when they get picked up by ICE. Some people cannot be released. And a couple of those people are people who are subject to mandatory detention. People, for example, who are here illegally and have an aggravated felony. People who are here legally and have an aggravated felony. They're subject to mandatory detention, which means that there is no bond for them and they must remain in detention um, throughout their deportation proceedings and any subsequent appeal. So if you've heard a lot of encouragement today as to why not uh, plead to an aggravated felony, yet here's another one. Don't subject your client to mandatory detention. Although mandatory detention is not the only reason that you, I mean, aggravated felony is not the only reason that your client would be subject to mandatory detention. Uh, people have multiple crimes in moral moral substitute. Uh, people who have some drug crimes, violence crimes, would also be subject to mandatory detention. And if you <coughs> want to read the list of people who are subject to mandatory detention, you can either go to the section 236, small c of the Immigration and Nationality Act, or read through the, the documents that I sent to you, uh, or that somebody sent to me, that I that sent to you, that I sent to them. I have a laundry list of people who are subject to mandatory detention. <coughs> Another group of people who are not going to be bonded out are people who are subjected to what is called feral final administrative removal order. And final administrative removal order applies to any non-permanent resident who has an aggravated felony. And basically, they don't even get to go before a judge, even if they scream that they want to go see a judge, with one exception, and that is asylum. <laughs> People who ask for protection because of fear of persecution uh, seem to be an exception to many of the, step, the steps that, that we have in our <coughs> process. But FARO, uh, it's a rather nasty process in which a person can be administratively removed by officers, not by a judge, uh, if you qualify. And um, I, I want to make sure that you understand that not everybody who is a resident is a resident. There are people who are temporary residents. They're not permanent residents. If your temporary residency expires, they also could be subjected to FARO, even though at one point they were considered residents. If that has expired, they will not be considered residents anymore. And can be, can be subjected to expedited uh, administrative removal order. And with an ex administrative removal order, you only have 13 days to answer. And a lot of people don't even get to my office within 13 days. I, I don't know where they stop before they get there, but <laughs> sometimes by the time they get to my office, the plane is about to depart. And I wonder what they did with their past three months. But. Um, FARO is a, a very, very nasty thing to do, and one of the ways to avoid that is to avoid an aggravated felony. Um, so FARO and mandatory detention is um, a person that doesn't get out. Another type of person that doesn't get out are people who have an order of deportation and are subject to reinstatement of that deportation. Um, so, so just because uh, you've not pled your client to an aggravated felony doesn't mean that your client is going to be able, if he takes the state bond, to get an immigration bond. But so let's assume that the client is eligible for a bond and they ask for a bond. There, there are two things that need to be proven, that they're not a risk to the community and they're not a flight risk. And crimes of violence are particularly difficult uh, to argue uh, as non-risk to the community. So if you have an opportunity to please somebody, uh, let's say, for example, that you have somebody with battery on the table and you're able to plead to simple battery. You would say, oh, that's great because that's a nonviolent crime in Georgia and maybe that would be great. Well, immigration law defines things differently than the rest of the human world. Um, and our definitions are not always logical. As a matter of fact, if they make no sense to you, it means you understand it. Uh, because that's probably what happened. So if you have a statute like simple battery, you need to be very careful to read the elements. Uh, simple battery under subsection A1 is um, language, provoking nature type of contact. Under A2 is physical. So if you plead your client to simple battery under subsec without specifying the subsection, the immigration judge gets to go behind the record and see what happened 